So welcome to Project Franken Mill. I'll try to keep the uh, cheesy and annoying graphics to a minimum, but I make no promises there. This is something that I've been planning to do ever since I started using the Sherline Mill. Um, I was planning on doing it later though, but I came down to the shop to make a very simple Y-axis lock and discovered that the uh, retaining screw, which sits along here, would be in the way um, this is the retaining screw for the uh, Sherline accordion millway covers. There's a plate that attaches in the front and the back, and then they're sandwiched or clamped around the saddle in this manner. So I looked at possibly modifying the Y-axis lock to get around that, that screw, but I wasn't really thrilled with the attachment method in, in general, and so I just started uh, ripping my mill apart and marking out and drilling all kinds of holes in it. And so here's the results. So I have removed, this is the saddle, um, in case you don't recognize it, off of the, off the machine. And I've got some blue uh, paint marker on there. Here's the table upside down over here. I have actually already drilled some holes in here. The reason that I'm, that I'm doing this, you, you don't need to do this for, for just the Y-axis lock, um, but for some other accessories and additions that I want to put on the machine, um, this is kind of the beginning. Of, of that whole set of projects. To give you an idea of the type of things I want to be able to do is we have our uh, nice origin cal from eye gauging absolute um, origin digital caliper which is getting rave reviews right and I mean it's a really really good quality uh, tool for a fairly low cost. Well how can we adapt this to where we can use it to make direct reading measurements on the mill? Well, eye gauging actually has an absolute DRO plus. They have another uh, DRO that's a, a, a little bit lower end than this guy. I'll do a separate review on this, but I need to figure out a way to attach this to the various axes for our X and our Y and our Z axis. So that's going to be some of what this project is about. The other thing is Sherline is now making, it's targeted towards the lathe, a carriage stop kit. The carriage stop kit is just two bars and a thumb screw. And newer, newer mills and lathes have a, a hole drilled through the headstock for these bars to slide into and then a uh, threaded hole on the front of the headstock to engage and act as a set screw for these bars. This will allow the carriage to travel up and stop at a certain point. Now you can use this for safety. You can use this if you're doing a shoulder cut where you're wanting to thin down a piece and then come out, thin down a piece, come out, um, so that you don't have to worry about where you're stopping. This will provide the stop. It also works as a depth stop on the mill. If you're drilling and want to drill, or, or if you're milling a slot or a notch or uh, any of those types of grooves and you want to go to a specific depth, you can use this as a depth stop. But there, so that that takes care of the z-axis, but we can't do that sort of thing on the x and the y-axis. So those would be travel stops. And on a lot of the um, larger mills out there, you'll have the ability to do travel stops by default, at least in, in the x-axis, uh, if not both axes. So I want to add that functionality to the Sherline. And I want to do it in a way that's uh, convenient to use and doesn't get in the way of of other operations. So I've seen some travel stops that use the T-slots, the um, but then if you want to put anything on, you've got to take the travel stop off, slide in your, your other T-tools, and then put the travel stop back on. So I wanted a way that I can leave a travel stop on the machine and use it in both axes. So we're going to be doing that with, with this setup. Now this is the, the Sherline way cover, and this is the one for the front. And it sets on like so. And then it, like I said, it uses some screws along both sides to, to hold it in place with the front and the back one together. The problem that, that I've got with this is mainly we block the x-axis lock. So how do we take care of that? Um, also, as I mentioned, the screws along the side block access. They do an extended y-lock, but if you want to upgrade this y-lock, you're going to be blocking that space. If you need to put any sort of DRO uh, devices on the side, you're, you're going to be blocking that space with these screws. So instead, what I want to do is I'm just going to, to 
drill a few holes, as I've already done here, in the face and also on the back. So the front and the back edges of the saddle. And I'll tap those. Then I can just screw this straight on and I don't have to worry about any interference on the side. Along with that though, like I said, we block our, our x-axis lock. So I'm going to actually put a little bit of an extension up here in front and create a new x-axis lock on the top here. And this will also give us some stops for our travel stops and also for some of our CNC limit switches and, and things along those lines that we may want to put in, limit and home switches. Uh, chip shields is going to be another thing we're going to address with uh, Project Franken Frankenmill is that we'll create some nice easy places to put some chip shields so that we uh, don't necessarily cover ourselves in chips or, or fluid, coolants, lubricants, things along those lines. Um, alignment. I also mentioned that I wanted to do some things with, with improving the ability to do fine alignment. And those will probably come a little bit later and, and we, that doesn't involve this piece here. But I am going to make some alignment additions uh, to the sure line so that we can fine tune it in very, very precisely and easily. And then last, we may be making some rigidity upgrades as we go as well. Now I'm going to be addressing a lot of these as, as individual projects rather than one giant long project. It will all be part of uh, the Project Franken Mill. But I wanted to get started with drilling a series of holes um, since I have disassembled the, the device. So I already talked about the three holes on the top. They're going to be, we're going to make a customized uh, access lock and stop and we can use it for some other items if we want to. Um, it'll be a fairly straightforward piece to, to make. Uh, just a simple block of aluminum. I've put three holes in here just to increase the rigidity of it. If you wanted to, you could move these holes further out to the outside. Location of these holes it isn't super critical. Uh, you do want to make sure that as you're drilling holes into this, you're not going to be drilling into any existing uh, holes or surfaces or working parts. So this may not be a beginner project. Um, also, you're going to want to take your time. You're going to want to do things right. Uh, you're going to want to make sure you're comfortable with doing this. Um, I, it, you know, you don't want to destroy your mill, uh, and you could very easily uh, make your mill non-functional if you do some of these steps wrong. So this I put as uh, 0.375 inches back, so 3 eighths of an inch back from the front face for those holes. This hole I just located between the existing stop and the hole for the lead screw. So we want to make sure on that one we don't want to you know, get in to where we're drilling a hole into this lead screw hole. That would be very bad. Over here we've got a, a hole down here for the oiler and then there's a hole that runs along the length front to back to distribute that oil and then there's another hole that runs across the length here to continue. So there's basically tubes cut inside of the block. And you can tell this by where the set screws are at on the piece. So we've got a set screw here, set screw here. Those are, are for the oilers that are, that are built into this, the oil distribution system. So we want to make sure we don't drill into that ideally. That's why I located there. You could come out to this outside edge. Like I said, it's, it's entirely up to you. I selected this location or this measurement, which is three quarters of an inch in from either end for some, for some aesthetic reasons as well as where the locations are at. And then I put two holes down in the face and they're also uh, three quarters or slightly over three quarters of an inch and they'll actually end up intersecting, but that's okay. That's not that big of a deal. We're gonna be using some pretty short screws here. Most of these holes are three eighths inch deep I made these ones a little bit shallower uh, because I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to drill all the way through the piece and I was just being a little paranoid uh, since I don't have a depth micrometer and I really didn't need to go a full 3 8 on these regardless. So these two on the front I have centered on the height uh, which is about 0.225 down is, is where I put them from the top face here. Uh, these will be used to hold our way covers but we can also use them 
to create a, a wiper and an, uh, an oiler distribution system by replacing or, or changing out uh, some of the items on the way cover. As part of this project, I will also be making custom way covers, and I'll get into the reasons for that later. On the back, I have a, another two holes. Again, this is going to be mainly for the way covers, but could also be used for um, a wiper and oiler to, to keep the keep the chips out and keep everything lubricated properly. These two in the middle are going to be to uh, mount a DRO, the, the reading unit, here onto um, the x-axis. And then I've got two holes on this side, and this is for the reading unit um, on the y-axis. Locations of these are 3 quarters inches in, 0.225 down. Uh, these I've got a half inch off of center, so they're one inch center to center on these holes, or a half inch off from the lead screw on either side, also 0.225 down. These are also centered, so our center line is roughly here, and they're a half inch off on either direction. And then these are three eighths of an inch uh, from the bottom. Last, I'm not even really sure what I'm going to do with this hole, um, but I did put a hole over on this side to kind of match this hole here in case I want to make a really strong um, y-axis lock that will allow us to do that uh, and there's a couple other possible uses for that that I have ideas in. What are you going to need to do this? Um, you're going to need basic tools, measuring items, things like that, scribers, punches, uh, some marking paint. We're going to eventually need some screws. All of these holes I'm going to tap 1032 since the machine is already set up to use a lot of 1032 screws, I'm just going to continue that theme. Um, that way we, we have to buy fewer tools as well to make modifications and things along those lines. This is a number 21 drill bit. In the first training videos on making that strap clamp, I mentioned that you could fudge the size of the drill bit on those strap clamps to a, a fractional bit. In this case, get a number 21 drill bit. Um, we are drilling into a much more expensive part. We want these holes to be more precise. We want these holes to be more accurate. We want our tolerances to be tighter. So get the right bit. I have here a small drill block. Now this is just a piece of scrap aluminum that you might recognize from some of the lathe videos. What this allows us to do is it gives us an ability to hold the drill bit perpendicular to a surface while we drill, if we're using a hand drill. In some cases, long term, we might have to use a hand drill. I'm actually going to show you how we can still use the mill, even though we have it disassembled. You're going to need a tap. So a 1032 tap is, again, what I've selected. I wanted to show you these three just so that you guys can get a quick intro on taps. So there are three different types of taps. These are larger. These are 3 quarter 16. Just they'll pick up easier on the camera here. The taps that you normally get in large sets are going to be what this is, which is referred to as a taper tap. It takes, you have to go in about anywhere from seven to 10 threads. I don't remember what the exact specification is to get to a fully cut thread. As you can see, the very tip of this is tapered, which makes it easier to start. And you, it's not until you get up to this point that you actually start cutting full depth threads. This is great for through holes. Um, this is what most taps are going to, to look like. Um, again, if you get a large set, things along those lines. But there are two other types of taps. This is a plug and a bottoming tap. All of the holes we're doing here are all blind holes. And they're all fairly shallow at 3 eighths of an inch or less. Some, you know, closer to a quarter of an inch. Now, if we were to use this type of tap, we're not going to have threads very deep. This is where these two guys come into play, is they get progressively closer to cutting all the way down to the bottom. So here uh, you can see we only have maybe four or five threads before we get to a full depth. And then on a bottoming tap, usually you're only allowed to have one to one and a half threads uh, to get to the bottom. Now on a 1032 tap, that means we're going to be within uh, a sixteenth of an inch on the bottom, fully threaded. So we'll be able to go fairly deep into the holes. So you will want to get a set of, of all three, uh, and I don't have all three in, in this size, so I'm waiting on those to be ordered. We're also going to replace the lubrication that's used on our Franken mill. The standard lubrication 
that Sherline recommends in their manuals is sewing machine oil. And I don't believe, I don't remember if they have a recommendation on grease. Uh, it may be lithium grease. I don't recall if they make a specific recommendation. But on their website, they do have additional recommendations. And on their websites, they recommend the use of super lube. And both there's a dry lube as well as a grease. So we're going to go ahead and when we put this machine back together, we're going to use that super lube. And then I did drill a few holes in our table as well. Again, these are going to help us to mount um, both our, our limit switches, home switches, our travel stops for manual milling, and we will mount our x-axis uh, DRO scale off of, off of a fixture we're going to make to put here. The Sherline comes with a, two holes in the bottom, and they're on opposite corners. So there's one on this corner, and there's one down on this corner. I don't know why they didn't do all four corners. All we're doing is replicating out and doing all four corners. So these are roughly a quarter of an inch in both directions. Now if people see this and they, they add in the comments that a disassembly video would be useful, I will go ahead and make a disassembly video. Otherwise, I'm just going to give you guys a couple of tips on disassembly. So this can be a little scary, right? Particularly if you have a, a brand new machine um, and you're not used to doing this type of work, starting to cut holes in your brand new machine and rip, a, rip it apart and are you going to be able to put it back together and all that good stuff uh, can be a daunting task. If, if you're not sure, don't do it. Right? I, I don't want you guys to break your machines. I don't want you to get into any sort of trouble. Uh, so get a comfort level before you attempt a project like this. If you're an experienced machinist, you're going to look at a lot of this stuff and say, oh, that's easy. That's a simple task. Um, and, and a lot of the things we're doing, almost all the things we're going to do initially, are fairly simple tasks. On the disassembly, it will matter whether you have a CNC version uh, with the, the motor mounts already in place or whether you've got the manual version. The one thing I will tell you about on, on how it's assembled is the lead screw. So the table's easy. Just uh, back out the screw and the table will slide all the way off. The saddle is a little bit more difficult in that we can, if we wanted to, we could remove the uh, the column from the mill and slide it off the back, but I really didn't want to go through that. Um, so I disassembled the front end so I could move it off the front end. So this is our, our lead screw. And inside of that, that housing is going to be a motor coupler. So this is designed to couple the lead screw to the output shaft of our CNC motor. The tricky part here is there is a screw on the inside of this shaft and it is very tight. So you might have to use some cheaters or, or if you've got T-handle wrenches, those would probably work. It is a normal thread, it's not a reverse thread. So you do just uh, turn it counterclockwise like you normally would. The other part that you're gonna run into is how to hold that inside of that motor housing since you're not really gonna be able to reach in there. The thing that you do there is in the side of the motor housing is an access hole for this set screw. So while this is in the housing, we simply insert an Allen key into that set screw. And now that hole is going to prevent this from twisting very far. And then we can loosen that screw back out. So that's kind of the, the introduction. I'm gonna show you guys a couple of very short uh, drilling operations, but I'm not gonna go into super detail on this like I did on the strap clamps. This is intended to be more for experienced individuals and, and once you are more comfortable. So I am gonna be skipping a lot of the details and the, the minute little operations here, but I did wanna give you an idea of what we're wanting to cover and what we're wanting to do. You know, show you some of the limit switches that we'll be eventually using if you're getting into that and some of the stop kit methods and, and all the good pieces and parts that we wanna work with here. Now for Project Franken Mill, I needed to be able to do some drilling and we probably could have done it by hand, but I ideally uh, want to get a little bit better than hand holding, um, plus uh, just a little bit safer. Now, if you have another mill, that's kind of the ideal is you can just put the piece on the other mill, locate it, drill it, good to go. If you have a drill press, 
that's separate from the shoreline, you're good to go. If you don't, we already have our, our X and Y axis removed, but we still have our Z axis in place and functional. So we can use it as uh, basically screw fed uh, drill press. Now I've taken a couple of precautions to protect the bed. Um, this top paper towel just is to give a little more traction since this board is slick. If you have some thin rubber or something like that, you could use that. Not super critical, but those paper towels are cheap. On top of that, I just have a piece of, of shelf board scrap. And then I have another pair of paper towels to protect the base of the mill. Just from, mainly from scratches and things like that since, since we were moving things around in different manners there. So depending on when your mill was manufactured, and this is the same as, as on the lathe, there will be a through hole on this step and then they also give you, there's also a threaded knob. And you can get a kit that's a couple of lengths of bar and uh, this threaded knob. And this allows you to have a depth stop that's adjustable. Now this is meant and I think even sold as a carriage stop for the lathe, um, which is a place that you'll probably more commonly use it, but it also works as a great depth stop. Okay, so these three top holes are some of the easier ones to drill, just from a uh, setup standpoint. I am taking these nice and slow. I'm doing this by the book, backing it out. I've got cutting fluid on there, and I put a little bit more in every now and then because I, I do want these to be as nice as I can make them and reduce the chance of any mistakes uh, since this part is a little bit more expensive that we're working on today. So this is the setup I'm using to drill uh, some of the pieces in the edge of our saddle our front, back, left, and right faces, I should say. So what I've got here is I've got uh, uh, my angle plate, and I've used a square to set it to 90 degrees, and clamped it down. And then right now I have the piece set up on a, uh, a one, two, three block in the one inch dimension. This allows me to clear the uh, gib adjustment hook on the bottom without needing to remove it in case you don't want to remove those. And it sets it up high enough where I'm not going to get any interference as I drill these holes. Uh, another good idea to do as you drill these is to, to protect the existing holes um, that came from the manufacturer. So I've just stuffed a little bit of, of shop towel in those. And I have a depth stop set in the back. Now to do the front face, I had to change my setup a little bit just because the, the, the gib adjustment hook would have, have hit the angle here. And I can't raise it up higher because we're limited in the travel of the mill. Although if I had the extension, the, the other extension in the back, then I would have been fine. Uh, but I just switched over to this other side and put a couple of brass blocks under there. Okay, if you are a, more of a beginner attempting this project, um, a couple of other tips. After you scribe these locations um, into your marker paint, then You'll use an automatic punch, is, is what I like to use. Um, this is technically a, a, a prick punch, but they, they often refer to it as a center punch. Uh, the prick punch is going to make a fairly small registration hole. After that, go to a true center punch. Um, this is going to enlarge that hole and get it closer to the, the, the angles on the tip of your, your drill bit. So this will allow us to actually bring the drill bit down and Moving the part, we can find where the center is of this piece. And that's going to be accurate enough for us on this. We're, we're not doing any moving parts here. These are just holes to clamp other pieces to. Uh, so the tolerances aren't, uh, don't need to be supremely accurate. And the next tip is with your depth stop, the easiest way to set your depth stop uh, if you're if you're using one, um, if, if you've got this style or if you're using a wooden one uh, that you're, you're cutting to length or, or whatever you, you happen to be using, um, you could just be using a bit of tape. Um, that's probably the least ideal, but that would work as well. With my bit here, I pretty much have my zero point. So I can take my depth stop rod and drop it down 
on top of my parallel. Now I've got zero. This parallel is only there to give me a height increase. Uh, my, my rod's not long enough to reach all the way down to the table. Now I'm going to take a, a 3 8 inch lathe cutter or a 3 8 inch piece of work stock and I'm going to place it on top of the parallel and lower my depth stop to it. Now I remove it. Now I've got a 3 8 inch space back there and I'll be able to drill a 3 8 inch deep hole. 